our main focus, without a doubt, is going to be on Japan and the liberalization of the gaming market in Japan. Um, everything else is secondary at this point. So what we want to do is make sure that we perfect how we operate in Macau, in Manila, in the regions that we're operating in. But in terms of development and initiatives, it's all about Japan. I think Japan is the really in the gaming world, in, in my lifetime and in most people's lifetime, is the really the holy grail. And so it's, you know, you look at the population, you look at how affluent the market is, and, you know, ultimately, also when you look at geographically, you know, uh, you know Macau is a great South Asia, South China play. But if you look at Japan and where it's situated, it's great for North Asia. So North China, Korea, Japan, there's a lot of opportunities there. We feel that we're the best Asian partner. We're not the biggest gaming operator. We're not the most global, but we believe that we're the most culturally sensitive. And if you look at our track record of working with partners, you know, the Crown Partnership recently concluded, but it really was a great partnership, it was probably the most successful global gaming partnership in history. And even with its conclusion, both Crown and Melco really do get along and we don't rule out working together. Unlike some of the other gaming partnerships that we've seen in, in recent years, we have a great partnership again with SM in the Philippines. And again, even within Macau at Studio City, we have a partnership with hedge funds. So if you look at the full spectrum of the type of companies, the type of investor and the type of people, literally multinational, all different disciplines, we work well with partners. And I think a lot of that is because of how open-minded and you know, it's part of my mentality as well. You know, I'm open-minded, easygoing, let's talk it out. And, and so I think for, you know, for the Japanese corporates, we would be, again, the most culturally sensitive and at the same time, the most easy to work with partner. In the future, when the Hong Kong Zuhai Macau Bridge is open, and that's why we're so excited about the future infrastructure support that's coming online. We've been waiting for many, many years, whether it's the ferry terminal in Macau, the Kotai Ferry Terminal, or the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge, or the light rail. Once, once all of these things start clicking, and in addition, I forgot to mention, Hang Ching Island and the Lotus Bridge, once all of these facilities are open, Macau is gonna be a totally different place. You know, the, I like to call it the invisible ceiling of 30 million tourists. And the reason there's an invisible ceiling is that, yes, there's no cap on it, but during peak holiday seasons, people just can't get into Macau. It's not the hotel rooms that's the problem. It's the infrastructure. You know, people don't want to wait at the immigration for three hours. And so once there's more access point and there's more of the aviation air route into Macau, it's going to just turn the city completely into something even more amazing. The unwinding of the partnership really started 12 months ago in, in May 2016. And I think at that point in time, because don't forget in May 2016, the market was still on a year on year decline basis. But what I had seen was that, you know, even after two years of declines, I said, the market is coming back. I sensed it coming back, you know, in, term, in terms of some of the data that I follow them, like, you know, things are getting better. You know, global luxury goods sales was improving. It was still on decline because gaming, the gaming sector in Macau and global luxury goods like purchases of Louis Vuitton and Prada, they go hand in hand because ultimately it's really about, you know, the Chinese population now accounts for 30% of the entire world's you know, luxury goods purchases. So I saw the data turning around and it's no secret that it came together with kind of the slowing down or the dying down of the anti-corruption, anti-extravagant campaign in China. 
And so I was very bullish at that point. And at the same time, I think Crown and James felt it was time after 10 years being in the market, they've made a great return for their shareholders. And they had some domestic Australian assets that they're committed to build out. And so I think at that point we had a, you know, we had a great friend adult conversation and um, you know, we decided to start unwinding. And, uh, and he was not as confident as you at that time? Yeah, I, I, I think ultimately you know, he, he, you know, he was on the board, he was very strategic at the board level, but you know, he wasn't living it every day like I am. I'm here every day, kind of living and breathing this, going to China, talking to people. Um, so I think it was a, it was a good time as well in, in terms of you know our careers and and you know James and I are still great friends you know literally like brothers um, but you know he needed to do what he needed to do and and it was a great opportunity for me and and, and for the company. We've had some discussions in the past, um, and you know I think. Our DNA of our company is always going to be fun, entertainment. That, that's the key of it. With Hang Ching, is, I think Hang Ching's development is going to be fantastic for Macau, especially the more integration of the Pearl River Delta. That's going to be a game changer for Macau, especially with the Hong, Hong Kong Suhai Macau Bridge. And then you have the railways from China linking up to Hang Ching, linking up to Macau. That whole atmosphere is going to be fantastic, and I, I, I you know, I, I do think that Hang Cheng could potentially become a Orlando type of, you know, of city, um, but it will take time. And our focus was, you know, I think Hang Cheng came at a time when we were deciding between whether we should expand to say Philippines or or Hang Cheng. I think we made the decision back then that. You know, ultimately, the opportunity um, was was more exciting in the Philippines. We love the market, and we love the the working relationship that we have with the government and PACO in, in particular. I think we'd be open-minded, um, but we'll be very strategic in terms of looking at because at the end of the day, we prefer building our own. So if there was opportunities where we can build our own, and a lot of it will be subject to, is, is it a redevelopment opportunity? Because I, I've been to some of the older PACOR facilities and you know, they're effectively like SJM type facilities in a mezzanine floor of some building. Those opportunities we wouldn't be interested in at any cost. Um, but if there was a bigger redevelopment opportunity, you know, a whole hotel that we can re redevelop, we'll be potentially interested in doing it. And of course, we'll talk to our Philippines partner to see if, if they would have any interest. It's a fantastic opportunity to have a monopoly somewhere within the EU. Um, but it is an untested market. You know, Europeans generally are not, you know, their propensity to gamble is not as high as Asians. And so we really have to see. But at the same time, when you look at the geographical location of Cyprus, it's, it's potentially a market for Israel and also a market for the Middle East. And so, again, Cyprus is in partnership with two companies. And so our role there is you know, it's one third effectively. So we'll continue to explore that in conjunction with our partners. And, um, you know, I think hopefully it's, it's gonna turn out to be quite exciting. In terms of managing the customer experience is probably the most important thing in our business. And um, we've been very fortunate that our Philippines business is doing very, very well. And the fact that more and more tourists are going to the Philippines and also high spending, high rollers, VIPs are deciding to choose to visit the Philippines as one of, the, one of their destinations. I think that's why it has prompted um, us to look at potentially increasing our fleet um, so that you know, 
perhaps having a fleet that is more focused on the ASEAN countries. You know, I think ultimately customer experience is only going to get more competitive over time, be it in the Philippines or in Macau or any gaming jurisdiction. Over the years, we've, I would say we've done more wrong than right. Um, but at the same time, we, we, you know, we've always had a mindset that we want to continuously improve. And, and that theory is all around the whole company. And, and so, yes, you know, we, don't want, we don't just want to be one of the boats that, or when the tide is rising, everybody benefits. We always look at relative performance. So even, you know, in, in I, I always joke that one of my happiest years was um, actually 20, 2015, 2014, 2015. And the market was literally, the bottom had fallen off the market. It literally went from 45 billion gross gaming revenue and that year dropped like 40% or 50%. But that year, I actually felt good because we were consistently beating our competitors and kicking everybody's ass. And what I care about is how we compete rather than saying, well, you know, any dummy can, you know, can, can throw darts against the board and, and hit the jackpot. That to me is less fulfilling. Um, and, and so what, you know, we've, we've learned a lot and we've made a lot of mistakes. We've learned a lot. Um, you know, from, from the opening of Altera and how it was rushed, um, that was probably one of the, the biggest lessons in terms of when we first started. And I think that, you know, I think like all new developers, that really set the path for us in terms of, you know, Altera turned out to be amazing. I'm very proud of it. I love that property. It's still probably the property that's most like my own style. Um, but when it first opened, it wasn't ready, and we rushed it at, at that point. And, and so we've learned from that to say, let's really be focused on quality. Let's really open when we're really ready to open. Studio City, we really built it for the, the mid-market. That, that was always the key. The thing that Studio, Studio City suffers from, and it still suffers today, is something that's actually out of our control, um, which is access. And you know, when we first started building it, we had assumed that the footbridge linking Studio City to the Lotus Bridge immigration building would be completed. Um, you know, the, my in my mind, and also the pitch that we had given our shareholders and investor was that it's a 60 seconds walk from the Lotus Bridge to the property. It's the first property, first stop on Kotai. Now, a few things has, well, a few things haven't happened. Let's put it that way. Um, the traffic going through Lotus Bridge is only 7% of the total Macau um, versus over 50% for Gongbei. Now, I think you can look at it as tremendous growth going forward in the future. But for now, with Hangcheng Island, the buildings have taken shape but I don't think anybody has occupied them. So once Hangcheng Island gets built up, there's more energy with that part of the city there. I think a lot of people will start using a Lotus Bridge. And so that will help us. But again, we don't control what happens on Hangcheng. Second problem, probably even bigger problem for us right now is the fact that the Macau government is building a massive light rail station right in between Studio City and the Lotus Bridge immigration. And so what used to be, what is supposed to be a 60 second very straight walk is turning into one of the most dangerous and treacherous walks a person can ever take. It's definitely scarier than bungee jumping to, to try to walk across there. And, and so we literally get all of our traffic from the Lotus Bridge cut off by, by, by that building right now. Now, I see the footbridge, the government has actually put the footbridge in place now, at least the foundation of it. And they were telling me that hopefully at the end of this year, it might be open. Um, I can only pray and continue to, to work with them. But again, once the traffic 
clears up, we should get a lot of foot traffic from, from that location. We had always imagined over 50% of our total traffic within Studio City would come from the Lotus Bridge. Right now, we get less than 10%. You know, last year was a very busy year for us as part of, you know, in addition to the concluding of the Crown Partnership, um, was really I had a massive management organizational restructuring. And part of the reason was that I wanted to put more emphasis um, at each of the property because I felt that, you know, with Studio City and Altera, it wasn't really getting the attention that it deserved. You know, they are, in any market, they are great standalone properties, but within how we used to do it and everything was centralized, you know, it was like, well, if something didn't work at City of Dreams, pass it to Studio City, and if that didn't work, then pass it to Altera. But so now the focus with Andy at Altera, David Sis at Studio City, and Gabe Huntington at City of Dreams is, you know, they need to decide you know, they're all part of my executive committee, but they are driving the property. So if there's something wrong with it, they need to fix it right away, ra rather than constantly saying, you know, give me ideas, give me ideas. And so, and that's why our organizational structure, I think, has improved and is a lot more high-powered now.